Again, thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to talk out here. I'm honored to be giving a talk at Demos's birthday bash. I'm also kind of happy to be giving a talk at Michigan. I last gave a talk here in 1988, which was 28 years ago. I, I remember the title, it was on the zero error capacity of, of channels. And I remember it particularly well because Bill Root was in the audience and he liked the talk. And to me, that was praise enough. But anyway, um, so thank you again, Demos, for, for giving this opportunity and for turning 65 with, while retaining your intellectual curiosity. And I hope to do you some justice in this talk. But first, I should confess that I had a lot of trouble coming up with the title of this talk. And it was for two reasons. One is, you know, given my speaking position as the penultimate speaker for this session, actually for this day and, and for the entire symposium, as it turns out, I want to make sure that there was an audience for the talk. So, you know, being now in a company, I'm shameless, and so I was willing to pander to your curiosity. So that was one uh, criterion I used. The second one actually was more fundamental. I haven't given this talk before. And in fact, I've been in this industry in, in automotive only since last year. I, I spent most of my career in the computer industry. And so it was a difficult talk. And I know that you know, one of the key predictors of the success of a talk is its title or its name. And you should all know that. In fact, it's also one of the key predictors of success in our own careers. And in case you didn't know, I mean, Praveen, <laughs> Demos, <laughs> Wayne, so you should know that. But anyway, <laughs> I finally came up with the title a few days ago and I sent it to Aditya. And he was quite exasperated. And to be fair, he did send me six reminders and I just ignored them. But he did not understand the turmoil I was going through. So therefore, to exonerate myself, I have my first slide is to exhibit my turmoil. So I knew I wanted to talk about self-driving cars. You know, I've now in this place, in this industry for about a year, and this entire industry is enraptured by self-driving cars. I mean, that's all they talk about, even though you know, it's a while away, but that's what they talk about. And secondly, it, will, it fit my first criterion. I mean, looking at the titles of the other talks, I knew it stood out. I don't know how successful I am because I don't know how many people have flown, but I'm happy to have such a big audience so late in this day. <laughs> now, so you know, so I was, I knew I wanted to put it there, but now I've been trained that you need an interrogative adverb, so I started experimenting. Why? <laughs> well, why is too philosophical, so I rejected that. What? What is kind of mundane, and also I can't fill up 45 minutes with a what. <laughs> so I said, how? I discarded it. I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I don't have the right to talk about how. Whence? Whence is kind of historic and full of opinion. So I moved on. Wherefore? <laughs> now you can see I was getting desperate with my adverbs. <laughs> I was really scraping the bottom of the barrel. And, and wherefore makes me like a futurologist. And I do not want to be that. So when, and now I'm running out of adverbs. I settled on when. It's good. But you know, the one thing is when is pretty prosaic. I liked it because I could also incorporate the what and the how. I mean the what and the and the why, I could sneak it in. So I had enough material. But you know, it doesn't have creative tension. So I needed some oomph for my title. So I brought in this notion of trust. And you know, trust is a very loaded word. I mean, every time you say trust, people think. I mean, you really go to your girlfriend or your friend or your wife and say, do you trust me? And see the guarded look that comes on. I mean, <laughs> trust is always a good thing to use for when you want attention. So I said trust. I'm almost happy with this. Then I realized that this is a pretty declarative title. It makes me sound didactic. And it violates all the training that Demos gave me. So I said, no, I've got to get the audience along. I've got to make it a question. So when should we trust trust? So now I was more or less happy. But then when I looked at it, you know, this title is askew. It's not centered. But luckily, two clicks. And so now I was happy. <laughs> and so Aditya, now you know what I was going through. <laughs> so anyway. Let's dispense with the when. It's relatively easy. And you know, if you look at it, all the, the stars, and somebody mentioned Elon Musk. He's very involved in this. They've actually got specific dates. The only problem is I don't think anybody in the automotive industry believes this. And it's kind of a little play on words. So the CEO of Nissan has probably gone out on a limb and said, 
driverless cars would be in showroom by 2020. Elon Musk, is, he's kind of vacillated. Tesla talks about self-driving cars now, and they talk about one coming out this year. But then he's also tweeted that it's be 2023. Daimler's conservative old German company, they've actually shown self-driving trucks on the US roads uh, sometime in October of last year. But that's not really production. So they've given themselves to 2025. Google's guy is the most kind of ambitious. He says, you know, this was said sometime in the middle of this year. So this was 2016. So he's again saying 2020. But he's saying it cleverly. But most likely all of them are wrong. But that's what the current state of the thinking is about self-driving cars. First, I want to clarify something. What does it mean to say self-driving? It's because that word is kind of misused and it's used to actually mislead consumers and that's part of the problem. So the NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, part of the Department of Transportation, defined this a few years ago. And so self, I mean, level zero, you can forget, nobody drives level zero today. I think most people today are driving level one. Level two is when there are two controls which are simultaneously automated, like adaptive cruise control and lane keeping, they're dependent. Level three is kind of what people are aspiring to. And level three is the fact that you can let go of the steering wheel, but you better be ready to grab it back. In fact, they say this without clearly defining a sufficiently comfortable transition time and the whole automotive industry, they talk about, you know, five second, seven second level three, three second level three, meaning they expect you to be able to get control within so many seconds. And that's not a standard. Different companies are trying different. And then of course, this is what self-driving means. Self-driving means you don't even need a driver. You just need to say your destination, go back and sleep, leave the car, I mean, put your package in, but that's what self-driving is. And people say this, but they often mean this. And that's a problem because humans are very suggestible. In fact, it's led to some tragedy and I will talk about it. But that, so this is the what of self-driving. So now having uh, told you a little bit about that, I'm going to change gears and tell you about what is there today. Today, you know, the, all the cars that are, almost all the cars that are sold have some form of this ADAS. It's not as well known a term because the industry has chosen to market self-driving. It's much sexier. But this is what they are supplying today and they've been supplying this for 25 years and they'll con continue to supply this for the foreseeable future. And that is advanced driver assistance systems which really means every function that a human could do that has been automated for usually reasons of safety, comfort, cost, efficiency. So one of those four reasons. You all have used this and to prove that let me show you some of the features that I mean by it as anti-lock braking systems. You have that because, you know, the electronics can break much better so that the, you, you don't get the rolling friction and it's safer. So, and especially when you want to control, when you're braking, you really need ABS. It's been around for, I actually have the years for how long it's been, but it's one of the ADAS features because a human could do it, it's automated. Adaptive cruise control. Now the first one was a safety one. This one is a comf comfort and convenience one. In fact, it's kind of funny, but I got my first HCC car three years ago and I was quite happy with cruise control. I thought that was cool. Once you use ACC, you don't want to go back to cruise control. You know why? You don't want to have to touch your clutch or your brake. And that seems, wow, I mean, how lazy are we? That's the only comfort. I mean, you can put on your cruise control and just make it follow a car, say, 20 meters behind. And every time the car in front stops, this will you know, also slow down. In the previous cruise control, when it's not adaptive, you have to touch something and start it again. So that comfort becomes almost something you can't do without. But that's the nature of driving. Nowadays, uh, there is a cruise control which, I mean, these features evolve. Now there's one which does a full stop, FSACC. That means even if the car come in front of you comes to a full stop, like at a traffic light and takes off, you don't have to start cruise control again. Blind spot detection, again, this is safety. And, you know, you probably all made, all of us have made a mistake where we've turned and, wow, was I lucky. And this is to prevent that. It's been around for a few years. Driver drowsiness detection, relatively new. It's in the high-end cars. And there's all kinds of technology that they use for this. 
I think uh, GM uses eye gaze detection. They have a camera in the uh, rear view mirror and they watch your eyes and they see how, how strong your gaze is to see if you're dozing and they check your pupil length. I think uh, Daimler has a heartbeat monitor and they also have some sensors in the seat and they do all kinds of heuristics to find out whether you're being drowsy or not and then warn you. The electronic stability control, this is again for safety. Again, it applies the brakes to help steer the vehicle and it does you know, pumping of the brakes. Hill descent control, I actually haven't seen this, but I can see what's a good feature when you go down a slope, it's easy to get, you, know, you put brakes on, you can skid, and this does the ABS type thing so that you don't skid. This is relatively new because now the previous ones, they use the non-camera sensors. Cameras are relatively new from the point of view of you know, using them for safety. So this is using the vehicle's camera to look at the speed signs, traffic signs, and interpret that and provide you data. They don't actually change your speed, but they display what your speed limit is. Because oftentimes, you're, not unaware, you're unaware when you're driving exactly what the speed limit is. So you know, now you can't use that excuse with the officer when he stops you. <laughs> Lane departure, this is also relatively new. And this is, I mean, the early versions of this, the ones I've driven, are kind of irritating. I mean, I have, uh, in, in my company, we've got some cars, we're testing this. So I've got a Jeep Cherokee which has this. And if, you, if you're driving and you try to turn lanes without turning a turn signal, it resists. And you get a little surprised, you know, when you're going 50 miles and you're trying to turn and the car is resisting you. So it's a UI thing, but I mean, it's, by and large, it's a very valuable feature and they'll get it right. If you change lanes with it. Well, <laughs> there are many things about the French I like and some that I don't. <laughs> uh, pedestrian detection, now we're getting into real safety. And this is one of the uh, things that the, the entire industry is going towards because, you know, preventing preventable accidents is probably the, the single biggest leap in safety that they can make. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just, if you're not ready for it, it's surprising. It's not like they're going to stop you. They just give you enough resistance so that you know. But it's irritating. <laughs> Traffic sign recognition, again, they use this with camera. And so now LiDAR claims they can do this. But I mean, clearly, camera is the right sensor for this. Rear traffic cross alert, again, a very valuable feature. When you're coming out of parking lots, usually you don't have side vision. And, that's, you know, people go through parking, they zip through and it's very easy, many accidents. Not critical meaning they don't cause death, but they cause damage. But this is easy when you have, say, a radar, two radar sensors, corner radars. They're, uh, they're uh, very useful for that. But the killer application is automatic emergency braking. This is beginning to come out now and just like with self-driving, of course, the car manufacturers are definitely abusing this term. But the idea is that you know, 33,000 people a year in the US and 1.2 million worldwide die from automotive accidents. And there have been many, many studies. At least 93% of them are due to human error and almost 90% of those human error ones can be prevented. So this is the single biggest feature and that's why I call it the killer application. And it's not just... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I didn't realize it. Okay, I will change my words. But uh, it's not just me. The regulatory bodies in both Europe and North America definitely see this as a big you know, boon to automotive. And in Europe, you've got something called the NCAP. It's the New Car Assessment Program. It hasn't mandated this, but what they do is they say that if you want to be a five-star model, and every car manufacturer wants to be a five-star model, then you've got to have AB implemented. And AB itself is defined by year. For instance, in 2018, it's in intercity AB. That's highway AB. So they give you some use cases, and the OEMs will test it. Typically, you know, the, high, the longer distance, if you've got highways, 200 meters, you should be able to detect. Then the next one is 2020. It's intra-urban, and that's when you come to a, a T junction because there are many accidents which occur when. You're trying to accelerate and somebody comes and hits you, the T-bone. 
and so they give requirements on what speed and what angle and what distance you should be able to detect and come to a full stop. Those are all test cases, so you just have to meet them. But if you want five star and you come out with a model in this specific year, you got to pass those tests. So in Europe, essentially you can think of all cars after 2018 will have AEB. Right now, these features are seen as options and luxury high-end features. That's changing, all pervasive. Now, the US was a little behind, and since last year, you know, the Department of Transportation threatened to mandate it. So all the manufacturers got together and voluntarily agreed with the Department of Transportation that they're going to do this latest by 2022. So by 2022, all US cars will have AEB. So in other words, say by 2022, Europe and North America, every car that's coming out will have this feature, and that's about 60% of the market. Roughly the market per year is 100 million cars, 60 million are US and Europe. And of course, when we say US and Europe, Japan is not going to be left behind. It's just that they haven't come out, and they will. So now if you look at all these ADS features that I mentioned, you know, how effective are they? Of course, there's hard to come up with causal answers, so you have this correlation. But it's clearly showing that if you take 65 as the baseline, then with all these ADAS features, and this is the fact that there are more cars and they're driven more, but the, this is the per distance, so it's the right metric. They're all coming down. In fact, if you look at it, some of them are coming down you know, substantially. So this technology incorporated mostly with the electronics in cars is definitely helping. And also, the second thing it's telling you is that the amount of electronics in cars is increasing, and that's for me personally very important because that's what my whole company is based on. But how do they do this? Well, there's a cocoon of sensors. I mean, today, you know, probably Daimler is the one which has the most sensors, but they've got 60 to 100 microcontrollers in a car, a hell of a lot of electronics in a car, maybe about 30, 40 sensors. So when they talk about fusing sensors, it is a big problem, and I will talk a little bit more about it later. But I'd like to give you an example. For adaptive cruise control, they need forward radar to go up to about, say, 250 meters. Emergency braking, also a forward radar, not as much. These are the cameras, traffic sign recognition, lane departure warning, because you can't see lanes with anything else. Cross traffic alert are corner radars. Parking assist is usually ultrasonics. You know, that's the one that gives you the beep, beep, beep when you park front and back. Then surround view is a feature where they put cameras on the top of the car, so you can see the car from the top. And why that helps is when you're parking and going into tight spaces, it's good to know your bearings. So, and then they've got other sensors, which I haven't shown. This is a front top view. They've got inertial um, uh, IMUs, inertial management units. And the reason they have that is because the GPS doesn't work when you go into a tunnel. So that coordinates with the GPS, last GPS reading, and it, it, multiple guidos. And until you get out of the tunnel, it maintains your GPS because you, most of these safety features are assuming GPS, and they also have gyros on the tires to sense the, you know, the car can yaw, and so to get the precise bearing. So cars are basically cocooned in sensors today, and it's going to be much worse, and I have visual proof of that when you go to self-driving. This is essentially today. Not all of these are on every car, but on some car, depending on the feature. How big is this market? Well, the entire automotive market today is about $2.4 trillion. It's one of the big workhorses of the manufacturing portion of the economy. And it's easy to remember how you get $2.4 trillion. This is in dollars paid by consumers to car companies. There's about 100 million cars. Average price of a car is about 24,000. 24,000 times 100 million is 2.4 trillion. But supplying this 2.4 trillion is a whole host of industries. Now, this is the portion due to ADAS, and it's I mean, the estimate is by 2020, it'll be 90 billion out of that 2.4. Well, it's not out of the 2.4 trillion. This is in dollars by the tier ones to the OEMs. Tier ones are suppliers, like if you have a car from, say, BMW or Daimler, the transmission probably came from somewhere, the, the chassis came from somewhere, the braking system came from somewhere. They, they just have a huge amount of supplies. All of them are very big companies, not well known. Companies like Bosch, Velleo, Delphi, Magna. These are the suppliers who supply the household names. Just, you know, ultimately, they, 
household names, assemble the cars, and they build critical systems, they build the UI, et cetera. So this is in those dollars. The $2.4 trillion is in the dollars that the, the final, the Mercedes's and the GM's and the Ford's get. So th you have to multiply that because the, the margin of the OEMs is very high on these features. I'll give you a good example, if you buy a Subaru today with an AB, it costs $4,000, I mean, to you. It costs them 200 and they, they mark it up a lot because they, they don't make so much money on the metal and the body, et cetera. But that's, and if you look at it, it's driven largely by sensors, and these are sensors that are present today, but they're going to become really important as, as you become pervasive. As AB becomes pervasive, essentially all cars will have ADAS, and so there'll be many more sensors. And I mentioned the electronics in a car is increasing. This is actually a slide from Prescale. You know, electronics has been increasing by every decade, and by 2030, the BMW chairman says that it'll be at least 50% of the cost of a car. So that's one of the few industries where electronics is increasing in, in most, like in consumer electronics is actually decreasing in dollars. So now, you know, having talked about ADAS, which is today and going into the foreseeable future, let's look at the why of self-driving. And there's a study from the Victoria Transportation Institute. It's a think tank, an automotive think tank out of uh, Vancouver, I mean, out of Victoria, Canada. So some of them are obvious, but they've thought through well, and they've looked at some of the downsides, the fact that you might have a misplaced planning emphasis. I like that because that's true. I mean, people think of this as a panacea. They stop doing the things that infrastructure improvements that they need to do. Then some other ones are security and privacy concerns. And why this is important is, you now as a car becomes more electronic, and you can see it, Today, you know, if you look at hackers, hackers started off with PCs, Windows PCs, then they moved on to the Mac, not as much, but then now they're moving on to smartphones, but in the last two years, they moved to cars. Because cars have infotainment and they have something called the controller area network in a car, which is how all these sensor systems talk to each other. To the infotainment system, you can break into that. And there were some very notable cases in the last two years where from a distance of two miles, they were able to get into a Jeep and just force it off the road. Now, if you look at AEB, you can imagine what people are going to do. Because AB, what does it do? It breaks the car. So they will spoof a target and make the car break just because it's fun. In fact, one of the discussions I was in with a car manufacturer was they have to take into account the fact that there will be teenagers who will jump in front of a car just to make it stop. It's going to happen. And so they're figuring out what to do about that because that will give, first of all, it will be a lot of liability. It will be tragic. But that's how people are, and so those things have to be taken into account. So this is a pretty good analysis. So now let me go on to kind of state of the art, what are these various companies doing? Google has probably got the mind share in terms of the self-driving car because they've got about 50 cars which go around and do, you know, with the spinning LiDAR, and this is the sensor package that they use, and my point is in talking about the sensor packages, this is over and above what they already have, and the fact that there is no agreement. You'll see that there's a complete disparity in sensor packages. And Google uses one LiDAR, one GPS, four radar, three in front and one in the rear, a forward-facing camera, a tire rotation monitor. Now, the number of miles, keep this number uh, in mind. You know, after Google started this in about 2010, and they've got about 50 cars, the Google cars, and basically in the Bay Area and in Austin, and they do they don't push it, 8,800 miles a year is nothing. I mean, but remember, this is self-driving miles. So the drive, there is a drive on the car, and he's not supposed to touch it, he's recorded. And they've got totally 1.5 million miles, and they have the most. Actually, I, actually it, it is correct, but there's a small nuance on that. It seemed like a lot, but I'll argue later on why it isn't. And recently, they, they announced a collaboration with Fiat Chrysler, where one of the minivans is gonna have the Google sensor package, and they'll be collecting uh, driving miles from that. Now, if you look at the incumbents, you know, Google, as I mentioned, going straight to level four, meaning they're not building any other ADAS system or incremental features. ADAS is incremental, feature by feature, and the idea is that at some point, you will break the chain and say, no driver. But Google isn't doing that, but the incumbents have to do that. Why? Because these car companies are big companies. They need to make money. They, you know, Mercedes or GM is over $180 billion. They can't 
forget about it and say, let's build the self-driving car and forget everything else. Google can. They don't even try. I mean, it's not clear whether they're going to build a car, but they can talk about level for all they want. But these guys do it in a little more in stealth mode. They're doing ADAS every year, but meanwhile, this is the investment in the self-driving car. But again, look at the sensor packages. It's all over the map. Six LIDARs, one LIDAR, two radars, 10 radars, 12 cameras, five radars. So clearly, I mean, and you get that feeling when you talk to them, they're not sure exactly how to approach this problem. They just throw everything they can, and these will not make into production. It's too expensive. You know, while they want all this, they also don't want to have, they don't want for it to cost a lot. So that's the current from these companies. And then some of the other incumbents, GM, while they're doing this, they claim that their self-driving car is coming out next year. It's a Cadillac CT6. They're calling that feature Super Cruise, but that's like Tesla's autopilot. And autopilot, again, while it's called a self-driving car, is clearly not self-driving because you have to be ready in that five to seven seconds, grab it. It's not self-driving in that sense. And then uh, Daimler is the one which has, you know, going on to his trucks and Volvo. And just to show you what these look like, Actually, let me talk about Tesla. Tesla is a very interesting company because some of the self-driving you know, enrapturement comes because of Tesla. Tesla has completely changed the automotive industry, which is pretty impressive for a small company. I mean, small in the face of the other companies. Take Autopilot. Autopilot is on the current Model S. It came out, the actual model came out in September 2014. And for six months before that, they had a fleet of about 20 cars. They were having their own drivers drive it around, collecting data. Because data is the most critical currency in making these features happen. Because you, you know, there's so many use cases. The only way is have data, run them through the test, improve the algorithm. Now, they launched that product in September 2014, but it wasn't available to the customer. But when you buy a Tesla, you sign an agreement saying all your data is theirs. Tesla just forces it on you. And every evening, the Wi-Fi gets that data, gigabytes of data. And when you're driving, the sensors are on all the time. We're, we're on all the time in 20, September 2014 to October 2015. They're just collecting data, but it wasn't self-driving, but they were improving the algorithms. Then in October 2015, they released Autopilot. I think they charged three or 4,000, but the Tesla customer, the special customer, two-thirds of them bought it, <laughs> which is a pretty good take rate. And not only did two-thirds of them buy it, but 60% of them drive every day with autopilot for four hours, meaning for four hours of the time on the average, they don't have their hands on the steering wheel, huh? <laughs> no, each. <laughs> and uh, so all the data goes to Tesla. So Tesla has actually 140 million autopilot driving miles, meaning somebody is driving the autopilot because there's about 20,000 Tesla cars, so it's not easy, not hard to get with four hours of driving at 50 miles an hour, you can do the math. So compare this to Google's 1.2 million miles. It's not apples to apples because Google is real self-driving. Tesla is this autopilot, but it seems the same, right? I mean, the driver doesn't have a hand on the steering wheel. So now the Tesla package is also in, unique in the sense that they don't, they're the only company that is not using LiDAR. And LiDAR is a technology where you, know, you basically have a laser, you scan it mechanically all over, and you get a point cloud. So you get a 3D map of everything around you, and Elon Musk and he's convinced his engineer that's overdoing it. You don't need that much. You need to know where you're going. You need to know. So he's got lots of ultrasonics. So he knows up to five meters, but LiDAR can go to 100 meters. So it's a philosophy. And that's what I mean by it's not standard. The next generation one, which is coming out this year, they're going to have a lot more hardware, eight cameras, 12 ultrasonics, one radar, differential GPS. Now, it, this, is, this, slide, this slide is about two months old. About two weeks ago, Elon Musk basically severed his ties with Mobileye. Mobileye is the leader in vision chips for automotive. And there was an accident, and so now they're searching for it. So I'm not sure this is still true or still valid. Uber is the dark horse. They want to have driverless cars because what is Uber's biggest cost? It's the driver. It's the 30% that they give you. So they're saying, you know, why not have driverless cars and then we'll have a fleet and you know, reduce ownership. By the way, it's not, so, it's not so funny because Ford is buying that. So Ford is creating a services company because they have to reinvent themselves. But they've got 105 employees and I know that it's not public information. I have an EA, I told her to go through LinkedIn, so she went through every LinkedIn Uber employee and if they said self-driving and we looked at their location, 
and that's how we came up because Uber is very secretive. And you know, they completely raided Carnegie Mellon's robotics department and hired a 40 professors, postdocs, etc., and gave them $5 million in return, kind of cheap. But this is what the Tesla self-driving car looks like. So this is all the sensors. This is just a production car. This is what Google's car looks like, and that's the LiDAR on top. And there's a lot of sensors. There's some sens sensor guidos on the wheel. This is the one from Bosch. Bosch is a tier one. They're not an OEM, so they use Audi cars, or they use, this one is a BMW car. Again, LiDAR. Ford's car, they got, I think, six LiDARs. Looks ugly, but like I said, you have to do what you have to do. And this is the Audi car. You can't see the LiDAR. They're using lasers. They're another company. Those LiDARs are from Velodyne, the ones on Google. They cost $80,000 each. It cost more than the freaking car. But you know that's why they're going to have to come down in price before it's for production. But these guys are using laser scanner, uh, laser scanner from a competitor. They don't have the same distance, but they make it look better so they can make it look like it's production. This is the back. So this is all prototypes, so they've got a whole you know, server, like multiple servers out there, but it looks pretty well managed. This is Delphi's self-driving car. This is, again, Delphi is a tier one, so it's a, probably not a name you've heard. They supply other OEMs. This car drove from New York to San Francisco, self-driving. At least, that was a marketing claim, and I'll have some numbers on that. This is Volvo's self-driving car. It's for parking, but they call it self-driving. GM self-driving car, the one coming out next year, the Super Cruise. They call it self-driving. It's not really self-driving. Mercedes, this is a real car. This is Lombard Street. It drove from San Francisco to CES in Las Vegas. Mercedes self-driving truck. Nissan self-driving car, this is the Leaf, the electric car. And their cabling is not as good as Audi's. <laughs> and this is Audi's self-driving car. And John, to answer your question, Okay. Here is. Uh, I just want to show you that <laughs> when you don't have pedestrians, you don't have drivers. This is on a racetrack. Google's cars go up to 25 miles per hour. This car was going 150 miles per hour, self-driving, and just to prove it. And it actually, there's a commentator who's saying how well it's turning and it's comparing it to a professional race car driver. But it's easy to do. They probably had GPS. I mean, they didn't reveal how they did it. They probably had a differential GPS, so they had mapped it, so they knew every curve. And I'm not sure, but they had a whole audience, too. If you look at it, it's a stadium in Germany. They got an audience watching this. It has a pretty clean uh, line. Yeah, I know. It looks like a pretty clean line. Yeah. So coming back to my loaded word, trust. The reason I use trust is that, you know, counterintuitively, people trust technology more than they should. People think, I mean, if I asked you, you'd think, oh, I don't trust technology. but the facts are, and the numbers are, that people trust technology way too easily. You know, Google drivers, in those self-driving cars, Google signs contracts saying they have to be watching 100% of the time. And then they found people playing trumpets, people going into the backseat and looking for their cell phone. And the car's going at, you know, at that point, the car was going at 50 miles per hour. Then they reduced it because they said, this is too risky. And then now they put some controls in place. If you look at autopilot, you were talking about autopilot. YouTube is full of videos of autopilot drivers. I've, I've seen one where the driver goes into the back seat, he falls asleep, and the car is going at 65 miles an hour. I mean, that's pretty foolish. So, and the problem is also the way level three is defined. The sufficiently com comfortable transition time is a huge problem. Humans can't switch on and off. Cars or electronics can, we can't. So this is actually something that many OEMs think is a bad thing. That's why they've got Finer granular, two seconds, five seconds, seven seconds, I think is the maximum. But that's still hard. I mean, you're listening to music and suddenly you've got to save somebody's life. I mean, come on. <laughs> so the reality of autonomous is the fact that, you know, the California uh, government has forced these car companies, if they call it self-driving, all these cars that I showed you, they have to report disengagement miles. And what a disengagement is, is you're driving, self-driving, and then you see something, you feel nervous, and you have grabbed the steering wheel, that has to be recorded and reported. So Google has been improving it every quarter, they had a 70% improvement and you know, almost a 4x in that year. And this is December 2015 numbers. But look at that Delphi car that went across the US. Every 40 miles, it was a potential accident. Now, that's hardly self-driving. And look at this, the Bosch car. Every three-fourths of a mile, potential accident. So that's why, you know, that's another reason why they're not fully ready. Tesla, 
is the most advanced. Tesla doesn't have to release numbers because they never claim self-driving. Officially, they're not level four. And so now, Elon Musk claimed that they're 780 million miles. This is the 140 million miles plus the 640 from when there was no driver in the car. You know, so they have huge numbers. It seems like a hell of a lot. Although, I'll come back to that in a second story. But look at the human rates. This is US statistics from 2012. Humans, we drive at 500,000 miles before there's a property crash. Compare that to 0.75 miles. So if, if you're a regulator, are you going to allow these cars on the road before they show some validation that they're better than humans? You are, I think John was talking about better than humans. Not, not with these numbers. You know, you'd want to... <laughs> I just want to provoke you. <laughs> yeah. Now he's backtracking because I'll, I'll tell you what happened with Tesla. And so, you know, it's going to be many my time more, and that's going to be the gating. And so the model that the auto company are now thinking of is the Tesla model. They're going to have to put it in a production car, but whether you have 50 cars, 100 cars, 150 cars, you're never going to reach a billion miles. The only way is you take one model, equip it, and get driving data just like Tesla is doing. At least Tesla has shown the way to get those miles. Now, the danger of rushing to self-driving, this is a... Tesla accident happened on May 7th in Florida. So this is the Tesla car on autopilot. So there are four systemic errors. It's like an airplane crash. When you analyze airplane crash, many things have to happen before an airplane crashes. So there was a two-lane highway. This is an 18-wheeler, semi-white. It was making a left turn, and at 100, it was 100 meters away. Any human would have stopped. But of course, this driver, he believed Elon Musk, and he said it's an autopilot. He was watching Harry Potter on his with the earphones. He wasn't. Well, they don't know that. He was definitely watching a movie because at 100 meters, you'd have to be stupid not to break for this. This truck was white, and so this is the reason why they got rid of Mobileye. Mobileye, you know, Elon Musk said we've got a camera doing, uh, uh, should be able to sense it, but the way, you know, with all these years of vision technology improvement, the way they detect cars is the two red taillights. In fact, the company I work with, in, in April, they found out that the Dodge Charger has a, a full line of red taillights and mobile, I couldn't detect it. So they had to have a software upgrade. So the camera didn't detect it. Now the radar, they have a radar. The radar did detect it, but radars are designed for azimuthal resolution. They don't have vertical resolution. So when the radar detected it, it said there's something there, but the camera didn't. And so they had this high level fusion, meaning decision level fusion. If the camera and the, and the radar both agreed, then it was fine. Otherwise, they discarded it. You might say that's kind of stupid. And again, this is part of the legal systems issues. The car, the OEMs in automatic emergency braking are much more concerned about false positives. Because in a false positive, the car brakes against your wishes. And let's say it brakes hard when it's highway speeds and you get whiplash, you can sue them. If you miss something, they're not liable because you're, hey, you're in charge. <laughs> So they actually want 0% false positives. Of course, I can give them 0%, don't put anything. But that's <laughs> essentially what happened. So the bad fusion, you know, uh, lower vertical resolution radar, poor vision algorithm, and stupid driver. So, but it was a tragic accident, the driver died. So that's, uh, as a reason, after that, the, all the entire OEM community is now looking at getting vertical resolution one way or the other, and they're even experimenting with LiDAR sooner. So now if you look at self-driving, tasks that a car has to do, it constantly needs to answer these questions. Where am I? So this is done with a lot of map information. Almost all self-driving requires maps in a big way, high resolution maps. What's around me? Tons of sensors. And therefore, there will be sensor fusion because you got to understand, not just detect the signals, but understand what's going on. What will happen next? Because ultimately, the sensors give you information about what's right now. But you need to be able to track, estimate. You got to make decisions which will affect what happens in a few seconds. And then finally, what should I do? So these, if you answer all these questions well, you can have a self-driving car. So what does that mean in terms of technologies which are interesting to us? Mapping, calibration, localization, registration, and data management, because the amount of data which comes in is huge. So for diagnostics, you've got to compress it. What's around me? You can see sensing, classification, sense of fusion, data association. And data management, again, for compression reasons. What will happen next? Tracking, filtering, prediction, and sensor fusion. And what should I do? Policy learning, 
I think this comes to what John was saying. The biggest challenge they have is the fact that humans drive a certain way. I mean, you, when you're merging, some drivers are very aggressive. Some drivers will just wait and pause. But the, if it's one car is autonomous, one car is a human, you've got to know what the policy is and you've got to figure out very quickly. So all this with functional safety, robustness, and security. So it's a pretty big challenge. So now let me talk a little bit more about multi-level fusion because that's a very uh, area of much research because it's so critical. And so I'm going to talk about different modalities because all OEMs want robustness, so they don't want to rely on only one kind of sensor because what if there's bad weather or what if it fails? So these are some of the advantages of this. So I've done some use case scenarios. Radar is much better at, because it's an active sensor. It sends out a radio wave, so it's an active sensor. It detects potential targets faster. It's very good at determining range in the radial direction and radial velocity. It's pretty poor at tangential velocity because of Doppler. It's robust to weather, and it, you can get pretty good fields of view depending on your antenna. Vision or the camera is much better at classification. Radar can do some classification, but through radar signatures. It's a very painful type of classification. Cameras can do classification with vision algorithms, except those are not as advanced as one would think they are. It's very much better at angle resolution. You can high pixels, so you can get angle resolution. Tangential velocity for the same reason. Lane detection, anything which is visual, lane detection, sign detection is better. So when you combine them, you obviously want to make use of the best features of each. And so uh, some use cases, like radar will quickly identify a potential target, but if it's a group of pedestrians, it's hard for radar to figure out how many pedestrians there are, if any one of them will move. Then you focus the camera, and that's the nature of the fusion algorithm we're talking about. So that's where a lot of the research is done. I actually have an example of a research paper where they do radar camera fusion. Radar and LiDAR. LiDAR is very, LiDAR doesn't do Doppler directly. LiDAR does time of flight. It does angle really well because it's a laser. It's a coherent you know, point light. But it does Doppler just by finding out the time of flight, time of flight, and delta. And the LiDAR pulses for getting some distance are pretty wide. Wide pulses are naturally low resolution. So radar is much better radial resolution. But LiDAR can do both radial and, and, uh, as, and uh, tangential. And LiDAR is very poor in bad weather. It's poor for sun reflectivity. And so there's some advantages and disadvantages. And then vision and LiDAR, it's a kind of an oddball combination. Both are camera-based. And LiDAR can actually do a point cloud, and you can actually see pedestrians, not as well as cameras, but you know, people have tried that too. And so this is kind of a quick table of the various combinations. And you can see the, the one that comes, and this is what most OEMs are implementing, radar and vision, at least for the 2020 time frame. Everybody is looking at LiDAR for self-driving, though. So now, sensor fusion techniques used in automotive. This is kind of a taxonomy of different types. This is based on relations between input data sources. So complementary, redundant, and cooperative. Complementary is when you know, you've got two cameras. They're looking at two different things, and you switch them. OK, I'll give me five minutes more. Redundant is when they're both hitting the same you know, source. And cooperative is when one is a radar. One is a camera, you know, the same thing, but different sensing. Based on input, output data types, this is, you know, whether it's data in, data out, feature in, feature out. Feature is, if you look at the image from the camera and you take certain features out, and in my example, I'll show that in more detail. And this is based on whether it's centralized, decentralized, or distributed. It's hard to say which ones are being used because there's a lot of gray areas in, this, in these definitions. And then, you got data association, which is, you know, let's say you get a, a radar and you get all these uh, readings frame by frame. If you've got n frames and you've got m points, you know, if you look at a car, you might get a glint from the corner. You don't get a car. A radar would just get a glint from the corner. Now, for the next, say, 50 frames, you get glints. How do you associate which glint is from which object? Because the objects are moving. You don't know what they are. So you've got to have data association before you can do tracking or estimation, you've got to know what that track is. And that's the data association problem. So these are some of the challenges that you have in, in doing sensor fusion, in actually the pre-processing to sensor fusion. So now let me give you an example of you know, some recent research. This is from the RD team. And this is for detection using a radar and a camera. The ones that they use are a camera with a fairly poor resolution and monochrome, just gray levels. 
with a 60 meter distance. The region of interest, they said, is a 5 meter, 4 meter height around the project projected radar reflector. So what they're using is, since radar detects early, but you don't know which part of the car it is. It could be the side panel of the car, so you don't know where the car is. But the minute they get it, they put a region of interest, and then they use the camera, they focus the camera, because the camera's shortcoming, or vision's shortcoming is, searching a big space is hard. Searching, so they reduce that problem by searching a smaller space. So that's what they do. So they train the classifier using, these are all the rear views of vehicles, and then they used HAR classifier, they used five types, they scaled it to get many features. So all this classifier does is rectangular portions because that's what the back of a car looks like. And you take plus and minus the gray level, and that's your filter. This is the hard filter. It's used in phase detection, the Viola Jones method. And then they first normalize it to reduce some of the uh, issues in the algorithm. This is the contrast normalization. They could have also done variance normalization. Then they use filters on certain points. So if this is my image, the the only points where the filter was applied were at the intersection points, but the filter was applied to all the pixels. You know, the filter applied to all the pixels, but it was only aimed at that one point, hard filter, right? Then the next day, they took these weak classifiers, each feature, they started off as being a weak classifier, and then they used ADA Boost, a pretty well-known technique for improving machine learning, and they got a strong classifier by doing a linear we a combination, a linear weighted combination. The way they choose it is by choosing the one for which the maximum information is closest, but up to a certain bound, because this is an empirical study that they did. Then they did this for each window, sub-window around the region of interest. They found out which of those windows had cars. This classifier is kind of invariant to small changes and translation. So you got many windows in which there was a car. Then they did a second fusion to combine all of it and they presented the results. So this is a good example of how sensor fusion is used in ADAS. So you can see that they got radar returns from this. They put regions of interest one, two, three, four. Then when they did the first part of the algorithm, they got multiple hits, meaning each of these is supposed to have a car. Then they fused it, and now here are the results. This is the variance normalization, contrast normalization, this is with the mutual information less than 0.5. But these results are extremely impressive. I mean, this is the true positives with zero faults. And the accuracy is, you know, making sure that that rectangle is exactly the car. Because, you know, when you're taking steering action, if the rectangle is this big or is a little smaller, you might still hit the car. So they want accuracy in the rectangles. So they're getting pretty good accuracy. This is not implemented. This is a research paper, like I said, by the Audi team. But this is the kind of sensor fusion that they're doing just at the radar vision. And there's a lot of research going on in this. So now let me come back to my first question, which is, when should you trust self-driving cars? This is previous deployment cycles in cars. So look at the deployment cycles. They're not small, because like I said, the automotive industry, safety is issue number one. They will not let anything out, and we should all be grateful for that, by the way. And so they will err on the side of being conservative, and it takes a while for all these features to go into cars. So based on that, that Victoria Technical Institute said, let's see what self-driving cars will look like. This is a study about four months old. So you can see that the vehicle sales, the fleet is the percentage of the cars, the new cars that are going to go there. And travel is a little higher because they expect you to drive more with the new cars. But the numbers are approximately, you know, but if you look at it, Really, self-driving cars will be uh, in the 2030s or 2040s. That's what they're saying. Now, the industry disagrees, but it's a pretty far, most of the industry agrees it'll be in the second half of the 2030s, the full self-driving car. They could be off. So these guys might be right. So that's my last slide. And so, first of all, um, message to Demos 65 or not, you better keep it up. <laughs> and thank you. So then I was thinking, okay, I know a little bit about discrete event systems. That's my area of research. I know nothing about diagnosis or HVAC systems. So I went to my colleague next door, Demos. I explained to him the